Hello, this is Michael Della Jacobo. Welcome to the Morality is Hard podcast. About a month ago, I had the pleasure of interviewing Kieran Grieg, who is a, a research analyst at charity, Animal Charity Evaluators. Unfortunately, uh, it's taken a little while to um, to uh, get my podcast up on iTunes, which I was hoping to do before releasing this podcast. But I'm happy to say that is that is now being done. So, if you're listening uh, listening to this podcast via iTunes, welcome. Kieran and I spoke about uh, a range of different issues relating to uh, animal advocacy, especially effective animal advocacy. How can we, how can we find the most effective animal charities, uh, the most effective ways of helping animals? We talked a little bit about wild animal suffering and some other cause areas relating to animals, uh, but mostly on farmed animal suffering. Uh, and of course, Kieran spoke a little bit about the work that Animal Charity Evaluators is, is doing. So uh, if any of that interests you, I think you're going to really get a lot out of this chat. So uh, without any further ado, I give you Kieran Grieg. I'm here today with Kieran Grieg from Animal Charity Evaluators. Kieran, thanks for joining me. Yeah, thanks for inviting me on the podcast. Pleasure to be here. I was just wondering if you could start us off by talking a little bit about your journey and experience and how you came to be a research associate at Animal Charity Evaluators. Sure thing. So I had a number of companion companion animals growing up. So that was everything from mice to fish to guinea pigs to a cat and a dog. Uh, there's some research that suggests that childhood pets may be a large predictor of attitudes towards animals in later life. But throughout my teens, I never really considered myself as a, an animal lover, although I did love dogs. Um, I was also always someone who took ideas just very seriously, and I was always pretty idealistic. So I guess what I'm trying to say with all of that is just that I was favorably predisposed to animal advocacy as a set of ideas. Mm -hmm. But I didn't actually go vegetarian until my very early 20s, and it was more than a year after that that I went vegan. And so I thought about this a little bit, and my thinking is that there were two key trigger points in my conversion. So one was The Earthlings, which is a documentary film, and I think there is some, uh, certainly some like correlational evidence from Human Link Labs that suggests documentaries are just like a really promising animal advocacy intervention. Anyways, after that film I became quite interested in morality. I soon came across the works of Peter Singer. Peter Singer is just like very well known in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, and his utilitarianism just seemed like a very good fit for my style of thinking and my background in mathematics. So I read like a number of Peter's books that included animal liberation. Animal liberation seemed to be the second trigger point and after that book, I quickly went vegan. Um, so this also led to my like chance Googling of Peter Singer. One of the first results that came up was his TED talk on EA. And after that, I really just went down the EA rabbit hole or the wormhole, so to speak. And I guess one of the other really important things uh, that I came across during my like immersion in EA ideas was the writings of Brian Tomasic, particularly his writings on wild animal suffering. And those writings play like a large part in my now significant concern for the suffering of wild animals. I guess to give a little bit more background on my professional trajectory, so I began working at Charity Science, and Charity Science fundraised for and promoted GiveWell's top charities as a result of my values, and I co-founded Charity Science Health, which is seeking to become a GiveWell recommended charity and has received a GiveWell incubation grant. Um, and during most of my time at Charity Science, I was also working part-time at Animal Charity Evaluators. And then I think a significant factor in my switching from global poverty to effective animal advocacy was I just felt it was likely I would have a greater positive impact if I was working on animal advocacy. And a large part of that was just, in my view, I felt like that was more where my comparative advantage lay. So in the latter part of 2016 I started as a research intern at ACE and then in January of this year I joined the team as a research associate. Um, yeah I think that kind of summarizes my journey and experience. Let me know if there are any parts of the response you want to follow up on or if you have other questions you'd like to move on to. Great yeah thanks for that Kieran. Um, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned wild animal suffering that's uh, something I'm also very interested in. I'll, I'll get you to um, I guess expand a little bit on we can talk a little bit more about what that is and um, some of the specifics, but um, just for now, I'll, I'll ask you to um, please explain what it is that ACE, um, Animal Charity Evaluators, does, 
um, how they go about doing it, and in particular, what their approach to effectiveness is. Sure. So, ACE's mission statement is to find and promote highly effective ways of helping animals. The promotion side of things is not really my area, but I can give a sense of the type of things that we do do in that area. So there are things like website optimization, media outreach, social media, some outreach to high net worth donors. Now, as for the finding highly effective ways of helping animals, so I think this is useful to break it down into four key questions, and I'll list them out, and then I'll go into a little bit more detail on each of them and how we tackle them. So the first question is, what animal advocacy cause area is the most promising? The second question is, what interventions within that cause area seem the most promising? The third question is, what specific charities are operating in that cause area, possibly performing those interventions that seem to be promising donation targets? And the fourth question, and this is an area that we have moved more into recently, is what animal advocacy research seems to be the most promising? So to dive like a little bit more into all of those areas, and I'll try and keep this brief. So at the cause area level, so ACE has completed a cause prioritization cause, sorry, cause prioritization write-up. In that we considered traditional cause areas within animal advocacy, like companion animals, animals used in laboratories, animals used in entertainment, like farmed animals. ACE also considers wild animals, and we take the suffering of wild animals very seriously. And then in order to prioritize between these causes, we use a common cause prioritization framework within EA of importance, neglectedness, and tractability. We perform an analysis on each of those factors across the cause areas that I mentioned. And the conclusion that we currently have reached is that farmed animal advocacy seems to be the most promising cause area for now. For anyone who's interested more in that, I would encourage them to visit our cause prioritization, cause prioritization right up on the website sorry did you want to jump in and i cut you off no i was just i was just going to ask you um to expand a little bit for anyone who maybe wasn't aware what's the scale neglectedness and tractability refer to mm -hmm. sure sure thing so i guess i usually refer to it in terms of importance i i certainly know other people would call it scale but basically when i'm talking about importance there i just mean the like how much better would the world be or how much better would the universe be if this specific cause was just no longer an issue? If we had solved it, so for example, if we had solved farmed animal advocacy, how much better would the world be? Uh, if we had solved, say, like wild animal suffering, how much better would the world be? And I think there are two factors which we can use to evaluate importance. Certainly, they may not be the only factors, but they are initial. Uh, important factors so one is just to look at the total number of animals in whichever cause area it is and then the second is to look at what are the experience of the experiences of those animals like uh, so moving on to the next kind of broad criterion which we use is just neglectedness and by neglectedness we mean how many people are already working on this problem or how many resources are directed to that problem each year. Because this gives a sense of uh, what additional resources might be able to accomplish. For example, if it is a cause where there are already billions of dollars going into this, say a cause like companion animals, where there is just like billions of dollars flowing into that cause every year, what will the additional marginal dollars do? Well, that's an interesting question. And we can compare that to, say, the neglectedness of farmed animal advocacy, where it looks like there's maybe less than a hundred million dollars goes into, into that cause area every year um, and then the last sort of question is or broad criterion is tractability and that is just like quite clearly getting at what do we what are we able to achieve with our marginal resources that are directed towards that problem uh, is this something that we can solve so something like wild animal suffering whilst this is a really big problem it scores really highly on importance also very neglected there's just like certainly not many people working on that when you look at the tractability of that cause it's just really questionable like I'm not sure what we can do at the moment on that cause uh, but if we look at other causes so for example farmed animal advocacy seems a lot more promising tractability wise it seems like 
if we do dedicate significant resources to this cause, perhaps over the next decade, the next two decades, you know, farm dental app, I mean, the concentrated industrial agriculture of farmed animals could just become a thing of the past. Does that cover that? Yes. Not a problem. Not a problem at all. Um, so I guess I'm going to jump back into describing Ace's approach and just the approach that we use at the intervention level to evaluate uh, interventions and perform reviews of interventions. So, so far we've reviewed leafletting, corporate outreach, humane education, undercover investigations, and also online advertising. We're also currently working on updating our leafletting review. Uh, we're working on a protest intervention report, and we're also working on a legal change report. So these intervention reports, they kind of involve gray and academic literature reviews. Uh, we do cost effectiveness estimates, interviews from the field, and we're actually just in the process of updating our criteria or the framework that we're using for those evaluations. So as our name suggests, obviously, animal charity evaluators, we do perform charity evaluations as well. So annually, we review tens of charities. This year, I think we're aiming to review something like 35 charities. Uh, about two-thirds of those will be an exploratory review. About the kind of remaining one-third of that will be a comprehensive re review. We have, again, a criteria that we use for all of our reviews so that will include room for more funding, estimated cost effectiveness, both qualitative and quantitatively. We also include organizational factors. Uh, there's like a lot more to our charity reviews, but maybe that's something we can go into a little bit more detail later. Mm -hmm. Sure. Perfect. That sounds great. And then finally, regarding the research side of things, uh, so we've completed an, a number of studies. So those studies have ranged from attitudes related to wild animal suffering to cultured meat naming systems, protest effectiveness, leafletting effectiveness, community education effectiveness. We have also funded a number of promising studies through the Animal Advocacy Research Fund. So if anyone's interested in that, I'd really encourage them to go to uh, the Animal Advocacy Research Fund website where they can see like a list of the studies that we have funded through that. One of the things that ACE um, does that seems to be their most high profile activity is to, as you said, um, research and promote highly effective charities. Um, could you please go into a little bit more detail about that and in particular the um, perhaps the shortlist process or at least how charities are selected that are then review go on to further review certainly uh, so there are a few different stages behind our charity selections and every year we release a really detailed page that outlines our process for charity selections and for our charity recommendations so for anyone who is interested in that more detailed explanation, I would really encourage them to visit that page on our website. I think it's called Our Evaluation Process. So to give somewhat of an overview of the process, again, I think it's helpful to kind of break this down into a few different areas. So this time there seems to be three areas. We have a basic consideration phase for many charities. This year in that stage, there were around 120 charities. Following that, at the second stage, we have an exploratory review stage. This year, at that stage, I think there'll be approximately 30 charities. And then lastly, we have a comprehensive review stage. And I think there'll be around 12 charities in that stage this year. Um, okay, so the, in the basic consideration phase, we visit each group's website and we try to determine their general focus area and their methods. So kind of the key question here is, what are the organization's goals and what are the general tactics that they're using? We will then generally prioritize groups that are working on farmed animal advocacy as a cause area, or possibly we might also prioritize other groups that we think are working in high impact areas. Um, just as a side note, as part of this review stage, this year I performed a systematic search for animal charities in France, Germany, Italy, and Spain. So after that, we, can, we move on to an exploratory review stage. At that stage, we will have multiple staff members visit the organization's website. We're following our seven-point criteria, 
for evaluating charities. Uh, to like really briefly go into that, that means that we look at room for more funding, uh, quantitative and qualitative cost effectiveness, track record. We kind of try and evaluate um, does the charity have a good understanding of success and failure? We also look at whether they have strong leadership and whether they have a healthy and a sustainable culture. Um, so as part of this exploratory review stage, we'll look up like basic financial information regarding each group. So that might be the 990 form for groups based out of the US or the equivalent of that. Um, after collecting that information and other information, we'll contact a representative of each charity, try and schedule a call. For most groups, we'll then write a brief review. So that will include like what the organization's activities are, and then we'll have a, a longer section and we'll describe the salient features of the group. And then we'll send that review to the organization for approval. The organization's feedback might then lead to a further small amount of research. Okay, so then finally in the comprehensive review stage. Uh, so this stage is really intended to be like really careful and detailed reflection on the most promising groups so that we can select top and standout charities. So some factors that we consider in our comprehensive reviews are just how cost effective do we think the organization's programs are and does the organization seem to collect and use appropriate evidence to guide its programs. We will then try and talk to a high level member of the organization. We'll have several questions addressing each of our criteria. We'll also ask questions that are more tailored to each individual group. After the conversation, we'll request a breakdown from each organization of how they spend their budget. So per $1,000, we can make this estimate of, you know, $300 goes to corporate campaigns, $200 goes to online ad advertising, and so on. Uh, then we'll write conversation summaries, read any other materials that have been submitted to us, and discuss each organization on like multiple occasions. We'll then write the detailed reviews for each organization. Um, so I'm not sure if this is going into like way too much depth, but after that we kind of seek feedback from board members. Uh, then the research team and our ED will all make individual lists of, for each charities, whether we think they should be top, standout, or neither, or if we're not certain. We compare lists, we kind of go through this extensive discussion process. And after we've had those conversations, we try and reach a decision about each charity. Okay, I think that's all that I have on that. Are there any parts of that that you want to dive into deeper or would you rather move on to a different question? Um, yeah, I will dive in a little bit on that. Um, I just want okay. to say one of, the, one of the nice things, one of the things I like about ACE's work is um, a lot of your work is very um, transparently published on your website, so that's great if anyone wants to look into any more details about anything we're talking about. It's probably on the website somewhere. Um, so just, just from having looked at a few of your top charities, um, there are often, at, at, um, as part of the, the reviews, there's an estimate of the number of, um, say, animals spared from suffering for X thousand dollars donated, for example. Mm -hmm. um, is, that, is that generally the final criterion for determining the effectiveness of the charity? Some, like, what, would you work out what you think their range of animals spared, for example, is, and then use that mm -hmm. to guide which of the our charities is more effective? Is it more complicated than that? Is it a little bit different? Sure. So I, I certainly think it's more complicated than that. Um, so our quantitative cost effectiveness estimates are just one input into our overall decision. Uh, so for example, for some charities, we don't even complete these quantitative cost effectiveness estimates. We have, so one top charity, so the, for the Good Food Institute, also for a few standout charities, so for example, New Harvest and the Non-Human Legal Rights Project, we don't even complete quantitative cost effectiveness estimates for them. So in that sense, they also do not play a large part uh, in our decision making and we can still make recommendations for these groups. Mm -hmm. The other part that I think I should respond to is we have a forthcoming write-up on this topic just about like how we do use our quantitative cost effectiveness estimates. We certainly do not take them literally. Um, so they will often have 90% subjective confidence intervals for our range of how cost effective we think an intervention is. And if we have two different cost effectiveness estimates, 
and those 90% subjective confidence intervals do not overlap, then yes, I think this is some evidence, but we do think the one charity is more effective than the other. Um, but again, it's like very hard. I mean, these estimates are like highly uncertain. Uh, they are approximations. They don't take into account everything. So we, they are a guiding factor in our decision, but in some cases they are not a large factor and they are perhaps even equally weighted to other factors or other criteria. Mm -hmm. Just as an aside question, if you, if, if I could give you uh, a near infinite budget or a much, a largely expanded budget to come up with a more, I guess, a more accurate uh, measurement of the effectiveness of charities, what, what would you do differently? Um, how would you, how would you use extra resources to get a better estimate? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, or, or do you think it would be better to um, to spend more money instead on looking at more charities with kind of a lower confidence level? Or would you rather look at fewer charities with a higher confidence level? And feel free to answer the first question as well. Mm -hmm. Sure thing, sure thing. Um, so to answer in reverse order, I think I would prefer to focus on a few charities we think are really promising and really just hone in, zoom in on that and become really confident in how effective we think these charities are. Obviously each year we were trying to kind of consider new charities but I think the focus would always be on a few charities and always just be really confident that these charities are just like highly effective giving opportunities. To go back to the initial question of if I was like in a very powerful position and I had all these resources to direct uh, so I think one really promising thing that we could do with resources is there are just a number of commonly used interventions in animal advocacy which haven't been evaluated with a high powered randomized controlled trial and after that was to happen and not just high powered but like a really high quality high powered randomized controlled trial after that was to happen I think we would just have a much better idea of the effectiveness of all these different groups Another thing which I think could be a really promising path forward is that for within our cost effectiveness estimates, we make like uh, judgments about a number of parameters. And I think there's certainly some like economics literature out there on this that suggests if you can turn these into prediction markets, or there's also Philip Tetlock has been doing like excellent work on this with super forecasters if we can kind of use those techniques to estimate these parameters within the cost effectiveness equations, I think that would also be really helpful and that would also really refine our estimates for, I mean, make us like a lot more certain about the effects. Yeah, great. Thanks for that. Um, so we've, we've talked a lot about um, how you evaluate different charities, but I think now we'll try and move on a little bit to more um, the research side of things that you spoke about before. So something I'm very interested in is um, ACE's social movement analysis work. Uh, and I, th I think this is important and interesting for two reasons. One is um, there's certainly a lot to learn from past movements, even ones that are not necessarily relating to animals. Uh, and also um, some groups today are using past social movements as a basis for how they're forming their own animal advocacy today. Um, and I think it's very important to look at um, look at the evidence behind this and kind of really pull out the key learnings from past movements. So could you maybe summarize a little bit of the findings of this research that ACE has been doing so far on social movements? Yeah, I can certainly attempt to do that. So to be clear, this is certainly not my area of expertise. I imagine what I'm going to say now is more my personal opinions on the, on the topic rather than ACE's formal position. So to start off, I just really agree with you. Social movement analysis is really important for the animal advocacy movement. Potentially, there are just these like really strong lessons that we can learn from them about like what will be effective for animal advocates. Um, so the social movements that are often mentioned as being the most relevant for animal advocacy are environmentalism, the children's rights movement, the gay rights movement, the civil rights movement, and the slavery abolition movement. Um, so I, to attempt to give like some overview of what ACE's findings have been on those things. So I, I think I'm going to particularly pay attention to the environmentalist movement. 
I'm not even sure. Sorry, I think we're gonna have to edit this. I'm not even sure Ace has a slavery abolition movement up at the moment. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, I mean, so in terms of the environmentalist movement, some things that are particularly interesting about this movement is that Rachel Carson's book, it's called The Silent Spring, that seemed to be seem to have a very large part in the environmentalist movement. Another thing which is quite interesting, I mean, just to return to that, the inference would then be that um, environmentalism, if it worked there, maybe also a book like that is going to work in the animal advocacy context. Environmentalism also had this a, quite a heavy focus on individual consumerism, so a focus on uh, recycling, for instance, and that seems to be something that is almost peculiar to the environmentalist movement, and it is also something that has come up within the animal advocacy movement as well. Uh, another interesting trend, and this is more speculation on my part rather than, I think, being thoroughly supported by S's write-up on the environmentalist movement, is that there seemed to be a movement from first individually framed messages so that uh, you know each individual should reduce their carbon emissions each individual should uh, attempt to recycle to more institutional messages but now we have things like we're attempting to uh, elect uh, governments who are going to import policies that are going to restrict the amount of carbon in- emissions or carbon markets and that type of thing. So that's just a really inter- interesting trend where we have moved from individual to institutional for the environmentalist movement. So another thing that I can say on this, again, speculation on my part, I am not sure how heavily this is supported by ACES analysis on the topic, but I think there's been a really interesting phenomenon with the environmentalist movement and how it's been politicized uh, particularly, it has now almost become a left-right issue or a progressive and a conservative issue where that is like how the different factions, their approach to the whole question of environmentalism has been but determined by their political beliefs. And I think this may be something we want to avoid with animal advocacy. We certainly do not want to have as much as, say, 50% of the population uh, thinking that, you know, animal advocacy is a fraud, it's some kind of conspiracy where people are only doing this to yada yada, that type of thing. So that is also something we definitely want to avoid. Um, I guess to touch on, like, the the social movement analysis work more broadly, I've just been, like, really interested in the work that DXC has been doing on this front. And I think that earlier this year, or maybe it was late last year... Sorry, direct action everywhere, just for anyone who was not aware. Sorry, that is correct. Direct Action Everywhere. They have a annotated bibliography where they cite a number of major works. So there's everything from Erica Channelworth to Duncan Watts. I think Sidney Tarot is there as well. Anyways, there was a really interesting exchange earlier this year, or it might have been last year, between Zach Groff of Direct Action Everywhere and Alex... I've actually never heard his last name pronounced. I believe it's pronounced Felsinger. On this topic it was earlier this year Um, I also look forward to seeing what the Sentience Institute is able to produce on this front so I know this is an area they're interested in Uh, so I look forward to seeing what they're able to work on and then I guess again more broadly talking about social movements um, two I guess there are like a number of other things I would like to mention on it one of them is that I've heard the argument made based on the progress of other social movements that animal advocates should focus more on institutional messages over individual messages and more on institutional interventions over individual interventions. And then another track that I've heard, which is interesting and I think it's also where you mentioned, is that there are certainly people who think that social progress tracks or follows or is preceded by technological change. And I think there are some like very interesting examples of this in the animal advocacy context. So for instance, back at the turn of the century, turn of the kind of the nineteen hundreds, 
uh, there were just horse and carts everywhere. Horse and cart was kind of how you got around. That was your personal mode of transportation. And then this massive horse population was just totally eradicated by the invention of the automobile. Another possible example, uh, whaling used to be a lot more predominant. Um, then it was decimated by some sort of advancement in the way in which we could gather oil or blubber. I guess the, the inference from this would be that something similar could happen for farmed animals because of the intervention of cultured or clean meat. And this invention would just you know, totally eradicate the need for farmed animals and this will make the social progress so much easier. Mm. One can dream. <laughs> yeah, one can suddenly dream. So I have like more to say on this topic, but again, I don't want to talk too much, so I'm happy to move on to a different one if you'd like. Um, I just want to um, just comment on the first one there. So you were to- talking about a focus on um, uh, institutional change and interventions rather than individual. Um, so are, are you saying that you think that's a compelling argument? You think we should focus more on institutional in general? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, I think that there are a number of limitations to social movement research. And to be clear again, this is my own personal opinion, certainly not a formal position of ACE. Basically, social movements, we have like a small sample size. The ones we do have are like noticeably different from animal advocacy in a number of ways. Um, I'm also concerned about the... I mean, this, just like the nature of the historical research is like really hard to establish causation or just cause and effect. I'm also concerned that within social movement research, there's just like too much focus on the cases or the social movements that succeeded and people were just like neglecting these other social movements that didn't succeed. It's kind of like a survivorship bias and we, uh, how the inferences about which you are in are biased because of that. So to return to the whole question, I think that, I mean, this is just a very speculative point on, on my part. It's not something I'm very confident in, but often this is the type of evidence that we are working with in the animal advocacy context. So I think that the social movement evidence is, yes, you know, limited in a number of ways, yes, weak in a number of ways, but it is still evidence. It can still help us choose between course a and cause B. Uh, so yeah, to respond to the question, I, I do think that the evidence is compelling enough that for me, I think I would favor the institutional messages or interventions over the individual messages or interventions. Again, to be clear, personal position, not a position of ACE. Mm-hmm. Cool. Thank you for that. Um, are there are there any initiatives um, in, in any field that ACE is working on now or in the near future that you're particularly excited excited about, regardless of whether you're working on it or not? So ACE is expanding in a lot of ways that I find really exciting. For instance, we recently hired a new digital media manager who's based out of the UK. We also recently hired a media relations specialist uh, who's just going to focus on, I mean, one of their main focus areas is going to be to increase the amount of media coverage that ACE will receive. I also really like our new research review process. Uh, So in that new research review process, all the research team members will review another research team member's work. And then we also have that work externally reviewed before it is published. I also really like our open science policy and it is a very progressive policy. So highly transparent. The code we use for all our analyses are public. The data from all the experiments are public, pre-registration wherever possible. We also include pre-analysis plans. So there are probably some really important things that I missed out in there. But if I had to choose one thing, the thing which I am most excited about, I think it is that we are going to be establishing a new research department that is just going to focus on designing and implementing experiments to help us determine the most effective ways of helping animals. Um, So that research department is going to be led by Catherine Asher, who just has a a wealth of relevant experience. She was previously at Faunalytics, the research director there. We haven't established yet a research agenda, what exactly they'll be studying. So again, I'm sorry to say what follows is my personal opinion, not of ACE's formal position, 
But some things that I think we are interested in are uh, the optimal ways to measure diet. Um, just straight out intervention research. So doing RCTs of commonly used animal advocacy interventions, whether that's leaflets, undercover investigations, I think that they can yield some really promising results. We are also looking at ways to increase uh, the consumer acceptance of cultured meat. We'll also probably return to the naming system question, is clean better than cultured or is there some other option which would be better than both of those? Uh, yeah, I think that's all that I have to say on that. Uh, are there any parts of that response that you would like to follow up on or would you like to move on to a different question? I, I'd be really interested um, to hear what the results are of the um, optimal ways of measuring diet study, if, if that is one that goes ahead. Um, yeah, that's that's a major underlying problem in especially interventions to um, encourage people to, say, eat less animal products or to try and encourage people to be vegetarian or vegan. Um, mm -hmm. Generally, so just for the listeners, generally the way you measure that is you, you would um, try and get some measure of, you know, how their diet changes over time. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, just often you have to rely on people self-reporting their own diet, which is not necessarily that reliable when there's other forms of bias at play. So, yeah, if there's any way to improve that, I think that would be really, really useful and interesting. Yeah, I totally agree. I totally agree. Um, so some things which we are interested on that front. So as you mentioned, we use these self-reported dietary measures. Usually it's a food frequency questionnaire. So the specific ones which are used in animal advocacy research have kind of never been validated. Uh, so we've been trying to make like some comparisons to the questionnaires that are used in like nutrition research um, and how valid they are. But hopefully we can just do that with the actual questionnaires that we are using. We can validate them against a... There is like a really detailed, it's kind of like a structured interview where you just go through with someone over the past like 24 hours. What did you eat for breakfast? Did you like have margarine on your bread? You kind of like go really in depth. So if we could validate FFQs against that, that could be really interesting. Um, I mean, other possible things are in all these animal advocacy studies, the power of experiments is always a challenge. So if we could narrow down which one of these measurements has the kind of statistical properties which most lend itself to being so that we could have like a sample size such that we would have a really high power on that, then that would be like really, really useful. I mean, other alternative ways, we can just like move totally away from the self-reported dietary measure Perhaps there are ways we can do this, like the Nielsen data set, or just like data from university cafeterias, or I've, I've heard like really interesting things where people can just use their iPhone, take a picture of the food that they're eating. Maybe there's something we can do where we like promote an app like that and we can use that as our measurement. But uh, yeah, I'm kind of skeptical of that. That just seems like it's very high respondent burden. You might just have like really high attrition rates if, if that's what you're using. Yeah, and I think there'd be some level of underlying bias as to who uses the app as well. In, in that, is mm, that is Interesting, true. That is true. Interesting, yeah. Um, so, Kieran, I'm very conscious of your time, so I might um, just start to wrap up if that's all right. But uh, um, one thing I wanted to ask you is a lot of people listening to this podcast are probably very concerned about animal suffering uh, and want to do something to help but maybe aren't sure what. So, of course, this depends very much on one's skills and their interests and personal fit. Um, but could you maybe suggest one or two things that people might do or maybe that they might look at if they're thinking about what they should do to help animals, whether it's for their career or maybe, you know, um, something more part-time uh, or on a casual basis? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I certainly can. Um, so I will preface this by just echoing your point. This is an area where there is just a lot of individual variation. So what I say might apply to some people who are listening. It certainly won't apply to other people who are listening. Um, I feel like I kind of have to mention the, like the classic advice of volunteering or interning at organizations, like specifically effective animal advocacy organizations. Also, if you haven't done so already, reduce, work towards eliminate, or just go straight to eliminate the consumption of animal products. Um, also try and donate to effective animal charities if you can. Um, so, okay, so I'm going to tailor my, the rest of my advice because my 
intuition is that the people who are listening to this uh, podcast are going to be a pretty select crowd. They're probably people who are very dedicated to the animal advocacy cause. So I'm going to say that burnout is just a really serious problem. Beware of it. It is something that creeps up on you. You don't know you have it until it's too late. People can go through a burnout and they are just never the same again. They come out the other side and they are no longer to be activists. They're no longer to really dedicate any time to this. So do take care of yourself. Effective animal advocacy and effective altruism, they're not sprints, they're marathons. So sure, we should always try to give our best, but make sure that the best we are giving is a sustainable one. Um, so another key idea, which I would like to mention, is I think there is a tendency for a lot of uh, intelligent people to isolate themselves. And I don't think this is helpful for effective animal advocacy. So I'd really encourage people to try and come into contact with other people, like in the way that me and Michael are doing today with, with this long form conversation. Um, because exposure to one another, uh, it is, you know, iron sharpens iron. And exposure to those ideas and their exposure to your ideas will really help with your own advocacy and will really help with their advocacy. And again, if we have time, I'm happy to, happy to go with another one. Uh, so there are just like a lot of people out there who proclaim the benefits of mindfulness, meditation, and reflective practice. And if what is if what they're saying about those things are true, then those things could literally be the best things since like sliced bread. So I would encourage anyone who hasn't experimented with those areas, certainly those who are really trying to maximize their productivity to like try those things out see if it works for you and if it does work for you you can just see a massive difference um as a very last thing recently the center for effective altruism launched ea funds where they'll be funding individuals with promising ideas so i'd really encourage people to apply for that fund if you do have promising animal advocacy ideas uh this seems like a clear case where there is you know, if you apply for the fund and you are unable to get it, then, you know, oh, well, you didn't get it. But if you get it, then this is excellent. You can do this, like, really high-impact project that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise. Okay, I think that is all of my response to that question. Do you have any parts that you would like to follow up on? I just, yeah, I just want to echo what you said about burnout and sustainability. Um, I, I have experienced burnout before. Um, and, yeah, it's, it's as you said, it's not, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. It's important to keep in mind that... Um, you, you know, if your if your values don't change, you will want to be working on reducing animal suffering, uh, and helping animals, or improving the world for your entire life. So, um, mm -hmm. it's it does it does no good if you say double your effectiveness, but then burn out after say a few years um, when you could have been do, you know doing doing important work f over your entire life. So yeah, keep keep in mind that your advocacy is a is hopefully a lifelong thing rather than um, a sprint. Uh, yeah, I think that's I think that's a good point. Um, so we, we did speak a little bit about wild animal suffering already, but um, I, I want to dive a little bit more into this because because as I said, this is um, probably the, the th one of the things I'm most concerned about personally. Um, so just just really quickly, um, if if anyone's still wondering what exactly wild animal suffering is when we refer to that, so it's it's um you can go back and listen to my discussion in episode one if you like i talked at length about this um but just just really quickly it's basically the idea that there is a lot of suffering going on in the wild say in wild animals and insects and it would be good to reduce the suffering in the wild just like it would be good to reduce suffering in any other um in any other setting such as farmed animals or humans um so maybe you could just talk more to your personal opinion if um because i, I know you said ace doesn't have a an official statement on this but feel free to say anything from ace's perspective as well um but um a, a couple of things i want to talk about and feel free to i guess pick one and go with that um one so i i think personally i think it's important to um we might not we might not necessarily know what we can do about wild animal suffering now but i think it's important to do kind of the base level research to find out like how big is this problem is it a problem um that we should be working on and like what could we potentially do in the future um so yeah maybe maybe if you just want to start with that if, if you have anything to add to those to those particular points mm 
Yeah, certainly. So I can certainly add to that. Um, so obviously, just the like sheer number of wild animals is almost mind-boggling. Uh, so the way I like to think of it is, for each person, there is if you kind of added up all the wild animals in the world, there is something like ten billion wild animals. So you can picture each person, and then picture that person with like. 10 billion wild animals on their back and that's how many wild animals there are does that does that include um insects because that's a lot higher than i actually thought it was that does include insects. okay yeah uh so suddenly insects in fact make up like the majority of that so mm -hmm. it's almost the fact that when we talk about wild animal suffering the conversation should like heavily focus on insects uh and, I mean, insects are just, like, this really interesting case of, I think there's, like, two separate questions here. So one is whether or not insects have, like, any moral status at all. And then the question which quickly follows that, uh, if yes, then how much moral status do they have? Uh, and then the analysis, I mean, the number of insects is such that if they have like any moral status, even if this moral status is like 10 to the negative six or like one millionth of that of humans, insects will still make up the bulk of the total moral value in the world. So that is something that we should certainly consider. The other thing to consider on this, <coughs> sorry, is the available evidence seems to suggest that just like fast swaves of wild animals seem to not have like great experiences um, so the argument which is often made is there are wild animals which are they kind of pursue an R selection reproducing strategy what that means is they just have like a really large number of offspring and only a small amount of that offspring makes it to adulthood the rest of that offspring perishes in some horrible way or it's like or ever kind of like starved to death crushed to death or uh, like literally eaten alive by another animal so i guess this like basically lays the foundation for kind of like why we should care about wild animal suffering um the point that, that i think we could address now is well like, what is there to do about it um so one thing which I think is one of the more promising roads on this is just like generally promoting that meme or promoting the idea that wild animal suffering matters or that wild animals matter and that it is like a really large problem. So that is like one thing we can do and I certainly think ACE is doing things in that respect. So we kind of include wild animals and now cause prioritization. We also have done like various studies relating to attitudes towards wild animal suffering. Um, so there are other approaches to decreasing wild animal suffering. Some of them are just like very, very controversial. Um, so some people have proposed that given the experiences of wild animals, it seems reasonable to suggest that they are just like net negative, that their lives are just better off and not worth living. And this is like the same type of reasoning that we can apply to farmed animals. Uh, a lot of people think that farmed animals just have lives that are not worth doing. I mean, sorry, lives that are not worth living. And that by kind of taking actions such that we reduce the amount of animals that are farmed, we are doing those farmed animals a favor. And you can use the same reasoning to wild animals. By taking actions to reduce the amount of wild animals, we are kind of doing them a favor. It is in their interest to do this for them. Um, so that is obviously a very controversial view. Um, but I would encourage people, I mean, I think it's kind of like one of these repugnant conclusions. And I would encourage people to really consider it and not kind of let their intuitive reaction to it just dominate their thought process on it. Because I think there are a number of people who have looked into this issue, and my impression is that of the people who look into this issue, most of them trend towards thinking that that like, repugnant conclusion is, is the case, and that it is true. Um, 
So I think that another really promising thing that we can do for wild animal suffering is that there are now coalitions forming within the animal advocacy movement. So an example of such coalition is the Open Wing Alliance, which is led by the Humane League. Uh, and that coalition is kind of promoting that we want to really focus on getting chickens, farm chickens out of cages into like a more enriched environment and this just has like these really large welfare benefits. So I wonder if we could also do something similar with wild animals where we could kind of like create a coalition of groups and maybe it's just too soon to do this. Maybe this is something we want to do within the next like three to five years. But if we have a coalition, if we start having these like large animal advocacy groups um, kind of maybe not like switching that focus to it, but just like really acknowledging that this potentially is a massive problem, like the greatest problem there is. So that seems really promising. And then probably my last point on it is I am optimistic about interventions which would use CRISPR gene editing as opposed to interventions which would just be focused on like reducing the amount of animals there are. I think that people have like this very bad reaction to reducing the amount of wild animals there are. But if we were to take form like some type of intervention, this like widespread intervention to really just improve, like massively improve the lives of wild animals, uh, that seems something like something which could be a lot more popular. Um, so yeah, I feel like CRISPR gene editing is like it's a really promising thing and it's a uh, I almost feel like it's going to be a cause area in and of itself within effective altruism but firstly we're going to have this whole discussion on CRISPR gene editing and whether we should or shouldn't apply that to humans um, and then I think if we do apply this to humans I mean okay so obviously what I'm saying right now is my own personal opinion certainly not that of AS. Uh, if we were to apply that to humans, potentially there will be these massive benefits. And I wonder if, you know, kind of like after we do have these massive benefits to humans, if it will just become like so much clearer that, yes, like obviously we should also apply this to like the other life forms on this planet. So I think that's like a promising pathway forward. But obviously, those are very long term goals. They are quite speculative goals. They do not have a large impact on S's current strategy. And they are like certainly not Ace's formal position. What you're listening to now is more of Kieran's kind of off the cuff thoughts on this, uh, but he's like somewhat considered it. Yeah, great. Now those are the those are the best thoughts. Um, <laughs> I, I think I really need to look more into this CRISPR thing. I've heard it thrown around a little bit. I've got a vague sense of what it's about, but um, enough, enough people in my network have spoken about it in some way that I've got to I think dedicate some time to <laughs> finding mm-hmm. out exactly what it is and what the implications are. Um, I just yeah I just want to I guess comment on a few things there in wild animal suffering um yeah thanks for sharing your your thoughts on that um uh, I guess I guess one one kind of like cliche or myth I want to dispel is when I, I guess um a lot of people think when when people think about wild animal suffering I guess for outsiders to the field a lot of the people think uh, oh so what you want to kill all wild animals or something um which is I mean you don't you don't have to think that or you don't have to want that in order to be concerned by one animal suffering i mean you can just like there are like we we are already intervening in wild in in the in the wild with wild animals in probably negative ways and so there are definitely things we could do that would improve wild animal lives without i guess like doing some drastic massive um actions um and the other thing is there's kind of another myth where people think what reducing wild animal suffering just means killing off predators so that prey don't get eaten so for example like killing lions is a common one and um i'm a i'm a generally a big fan of sam harris but recently one of his recent podcasts he he kind of made it sound like wild animal suffering concern was just about killing predator predators um which i find a little bit frustrating and i guess just wanted to make it clear to the audience that that's that's not really. I mean, that may that may well be one intervention which I haven't personally thought through. It, um, but I mean, there's a, there's a lot of ways to come at this problem. A lot of different things you could do. So, um, it's it's just generally it's just the idea that wild animal suffering is bad. So thanks again for joining me today, Kieran. It's um, yeah, it's been really great to talk and uh, to hear a little bit about what you're doing at Ace. 
Um, yeah, if, if someone's interested in finding out more about ACE's work or your own, um, where can they look? What can they do? How can they get involved? Yeah, it was my pleasure to join you. Thanks so much for having me. Um, probably the best way to follow ACE's work is to sign up for our monthly newsletter or to follow our blog. We're also active on the like major social media pl platforms, so uh, like perform the relevant action in order to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or even on Instagram. If you would like to get in touch with me personally, you can just email me on my ACE email. All of the ACE staff emails are listed on the website. You should be able to find them on the Meet Our Team page. As for my personal work, I don't really have a personal outlet for my work at the moment. So if you're interested in following my work, again, the best thing to do is just to follow S's work. Great. Okay. Thank you, Kieran. That's okay. Thanks for having me again. Thank you again for listening. This was the Morality is Hard podcast. If you enjoyed this, we are now on iTunes, so you can find uh, any future episodes on there just uh, on, by searching Morality is Hard. You can find us uh, on Facebook as well. Morality is Hard is the page name. Uh, and please uh, give us a like to um, stay up to date on in, on uh, our future episodes. Um, and if you're interested in my personal work, then you can check out my website at michaeldella.com. Uh, but this has been the Morality is Hard podcast. And until next time, thanks for listening.